Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. The cyber underground. I'm Jay Fidel, singing for Dave Stevens today. And our guest is Percy Ellis from KCC. He's a lecturer there, and he teaches certification, among other things, information technology certification. We're going to talk to him about that. First, I got to tell you a story. Okay, it was October second, nineteen sixty-five. <clears throat> I'm not sure you were born yet. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I saw my first computer. It was an IBM Don't Spindle and Utilate or Fold type with punch cards. It was in the FAA building, then known as the FAA building, down in the entryway to Waikiki. And a guy named Lonnie Goldman showed me this thing. I couldn't believe it. A computer, an actual computer. Now look what's happened. <laughs> we got them everywhere. The problem is that they're more sophisticated, and there aren't Lonnie Goldmans around that can explain it to you. It's much more complicated. Actually, he's still around, and, and yeah, and so we need to be certified. We need to have education, and the public needs to know that we are educated, because it's a jungle out there. There are problems in every operating system. It's not perfect. You need people who are experts, and that's what you lecture about, yeah? Yeah, exactly. How'd you get into it? Well, the certification, I was a Novell a network administrator for Caltrans. That was my first job after I got my degree from San, San Diego State. And I was working on a problem, and we brought in some outside experts from Provo, Utah. And they were Novell certified. And I asked them, well, how'd you get to be a Novell administrator? I wanted to be able to do my job completely and not bring in these outside experts. And they said, well, you take an exam. And like I was saying to you earlier, they were the Maytag experts. Meaning you don't have to be an expert for equipment and operating system that doesn't need fixing. <laughs> yeah, well, they knew that equipment. They knew their gear better than someone who was a generalist. Mm -hmm. So they told me the process of preparing for the exam, studying for the exam, and then I took the exam and I passed it and I became, that was my first certification. Your first certification. Then you found out, this has got to be part of it, Percy. You were good at it. You, you, <laughs> some, you know, some people in the world who don't like to take tests, sure. who are intimidated by tests, I mean, you can find them on every street corner. <clears throat> but Percy, you're good at it, aren't you? You like taking tests and you like being certified and you like teaching about certification. Yes, I do. Um, I like taking tests because I like benchmarking my skills. So I like knowing that at one point in my life, I knew enough to get over a specific hurdle. And then teaching those certifications has been really valuable for me because I can pass the knowledge down to students and then they can use these to build their resume. Because a lot of students don't have uh, any experience, so they can use these certifications in lieu of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, when I when I went to law school, when, you know, you had law teachers, but when you were finished, I'd take the bar exam. Exactly. Okay, and they had separate teachers for the bar exam because you had to wrap your mind around exactly how that exam would work. Couldn't pass that exam, couldn't practice. Your career was in jeopardy, right? So <clears throat> it was a different kind of approach. And they're going to tell you, here's the kinds of questions you can expect. Um, here's the kind of answers you can give and be right. And here's the ones you can give and be wrong. And so it was not, and not the substance philosophical discussion you got in law school. It was just, you know, practical. Uh, take the test, pass the test. Is, am I, is my distinction appropriate in the IT field? Absolutely. So after the Novell exam, I started, Microsoft came on the scene with Windows 95, Windows NT. And I saw that being the route I wanted to go. So I went the Microsoft route. But IT generalists tended to not um, take the certification exams. So they had um, no way other than their hands-on experience to really um, prove that they were um, 
capable of doing a task. Mm -hmm. And they had learned best practices. So they kind of pigeonholed themselves by being, oh, say, a Superdome, HP Superdome expert. And then when they needed to, um, say, switch jobs, they had to stay within that HP Superdome environment. Mm -hmm. they, they couldn't ex expand out into other related environments. So and the other thing is that if you, you really do well in a given company, on a, on a given machine, or a given software, um, and you are the hero of the company on that, uh, when you want to move, and moving is, you know, de rigueur in, in technology, everybody's always moving, um, you have to convince the next guy, the next IT manager, that you're worth the job. Um, and, you know, you can just, you can reel off stuff you know, but you, there needs to be a common denominator where he can tell that you really are qualified. And the best way in a complex field you know, because the IT manager, the one interviewing you, he may not know that much, actually. But if he has scores, if he sees certifications, he's much more likely to be convinced that you, you know your stuff. Am I right? Absolutely. Uh, let's take um, office certifications. So your Word, PowerPoint, Excel, I've certified in those applications. Now, I could say, I know word processing. I know spreadsheets. But... If I pass these exams with uh, the Microsoft benchmarks, then the employer has something concrete that they can say as far as proficiencies in these specific applications. Yeah. And this goes through to the server products, Exchange, uh, SQL, all of the different products that Microsoft or Novell uh, creates, and even the independent third-party certifications like the CompTIA certifications. So um, you put it on your resume, of course. Absolutely. When I mean, you talk to that hiring manager, you're going to give them a resume which has your certifications to demonstrate, and, and these are by organizations. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you're going to demonstrate to him that you've been certified this, that, and the other thing. Um, am I right to think, Percy, that the more certifications that you have on that resume, the more marketable you are, the more money you're going to make? Or is there a point where, you know, you know I'm qualified in DBase 2, <laughs> which, which went out in oh, 1983. Sure. You know, that may not be too persuasive to him, yeah? And that's one of the reasons I try to keep my certifications up to date. You can be um, kind of typecast as a novel a network administrator and then you're of no use to anyone because everyone's migrated away from Novell. So staying up to date is very important with your certifications. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be looking for certifications in currently popular, you know, uh, deployed programs, among other things. Yeah? Not necessarily. Um, there are a lot of installations or operations where they're still using older software. So they may like the fact that you're a COBOL programmer mm -hmm. or a NetWare administrator because they're still running NetWare 4, NetWare 5. And they need someone who is proficient in those older technologies. Mm -hmm. They might be running Windows 2000 or I was um, somewhere and I saw Windows 7 on a desktop. A lot of people are still running older technology so they may look for someone, but for the most part, you want to stay current. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I started my own experience coding in 1979. And, um, I, you know, I've been through a number, of, and I'm not a professional, and I wouldn't claim to be on anything. But um, if, if I've been doing it a long time, and, and if I demonstrate that I have, you know, experience in the old ones, and maybe the ones that are 20 years and 10 years and five years old, Am I, am I going to know more? Is my, does my experience in an older program count for his examination and his evaluation of me for a job now in newer programs? I would think so, because if you know the fundamentals of information technology, those haven't changed. Input, processing, output, storage, right? And then the basic programming uh, constructs like 4 next loops, uh, straight line programming.
uh, systems analysis, how you go out and gather requirements for uh, a user's needs. Those haven't really changed. But so if you can write in pseudocode? Sure. Then you can change that to. Pseudocode is like words to describe what the functions are, would call for if it was real code. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Then you can translate that to any modern code, say C Sharp, Java, or C++. Um, yeah. So in the classes that you lecture in here in KCC, are you, are you um, well, you have to pick certain kinds of certifications you want to talk about. What, if I walk into your class, Percy, um, what are you going to teach me? What certifications are you going to help me with? Well, right now I'm, I'm retired <coughs> from Yuba College in Marysville, California. So I came here and I was teaching ICS 101, which is an intro to computer science class. So we don't talk too much about certification. We just talk about basic office um, applications, the Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Oh, so you, Access. You, you're going to give them a foundation in, all, in, in foundational type software. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, we're thinking about introducing the CompTIA IT Fundamentals um, certification into that course because that's a good place for students to um, get started with certification. So they come out of the class not only with a uh, good foundation in those applications, but something they can put on their resume, yeah. which would be uh, that certification. Now, in terms of taking a test, I mean, I know, for example, we have TriCasters here, the new tech uh, switching product. That's We run the studio on that. Um, and, and you can be certified in various uh, models of TriCaster. Exactly. It's not an easy test. No. Um, there has to be a proctor in the room. You, you know, yes. it's all very serious. And uh, a lot of people fail the test, you know. Yes. And it costs money, hundreds of dollars, to even take the test. Yes. If you get the test, I suppose you're you're in you know in a good position in the marketplace. Although there aren't a lot of those machines here in Hawaii. Um, and so I guess my question is, how do you prepare for a certification test? Um, what do you read? What do you see? What do you, what do you do to get up? to a level of knowledge and proficiency that you can score on the test? Well, first of all, hands-on experience. You have to be able to look at the exam objectives, which are readily available on the CompTIA or Microsoft Novell or even Oracle websites. So you look at the exam objectives, and you go through those exam objectives, and you make sure you can do everything that those... Read the materials, yeah. Yeah, so you're going to read the materials, and then you have to lab. So what? What have to? Did you say you have to laugh? Laugh. I think you should laugh everywhere about everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Percy yeah. has a good sense of humor. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you need to set up a home lab with home equipment, so you can say um, a machine with that software on it, or several machines. Ah. Yeah, several machines. If you don't have a lab at on campus. Mm -hmm or at your work site. So suppose I was rolling out um, 30 Windows clients for a customer. Mm -hmm. I might try going to each desktop with a DVD. Well, that's one way of doing it. You might want to roll them out from a server so you turn on the machine and the software gets installed from a server. But each one of those methods is something that is part of the say, Windows deployment exam objectives. How do you know you're ready? You take practice tests. There's great practice tests available from Cert Blaster, uh, Exam Cram, uh, now Pocket Prep. And you take those uh, tests until you're scoring 90 to 100% on those tests. But you don't want to be a paper certified person. True. Now, what's, what is that? Doesn't, that sounds, you know, sort of mm, fragile, thin, um, not, not really um, substantially um, um, knowledgeable. Uh, what, what is a paper certified person? <laughs> People can take the exam and they're really good at reading questions and figuring out what the answer is, but they don't have any substance behind their uh, experience. So they, they're good at taking tests, but they didn't 
do the laps. They didn't, they don't have any hands-on experience. So you need to either volunteer or intern and have some hands-on experience doing what um, those exam objectives have outlined. And you have to feel that you had that level of, you know, understanding. It's like any subject, isn't it? You have to, you have to integrate that somehow into your thinking. Yes. Does a coach help? You know, I, for example, I do FileMaker, which is an Apple subsidiary. Yeah. And I'm a coach in Indianapolis, and I call him every week or two, and he answers my questions. And I learn a lot. I learn things I would never be able to figure out, at least not easily myself. Um, does a coach help? I mentor and I tutor for a, a company um, called Parliament Tutors, and I'm tutoring a young man in uh, who's taking classes at the University of Phoenix. So being finding a mentor, and it's really easy to go to, say, the Network Professionals Association or um, look online and find someone who's doing the job and kind of Get them under your, get under their wing. Yeah. So uh, you don't coach in FileMaker, do you? I used to. Well, okay. Well, we're gonna take a break so I can ask you some questions about FileMaker. That's Percy Ellis with KCC. He's a lecturer in certification, among other things, in IT. We'll be right back. I'm gonna talk to him during the break, and maybe we'll tell you what he said. We'll be right back. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm gonna keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're gonna talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're gonna definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matters to tech, matter to science, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests. The students of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Boy, that was good. You know, Percy is one of the few guys in Hawaii who knows something about FileMaker, and I am so glad to have met him about that. And, and after the show, Percy, I want to show you what we have here in the studio oh, yeah. using FileMaker, because we use it for a lot of things. It's a relational database. It's been around for 25 years, I think. Yes. And it's, and it's one of those things where they keep on improving it. It's up to version 17 just came out. Yeah. And it's relational now. It's not a file. Oh, completely file. relational. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can do a lot of things with it, including process text. So you know, it's for us, it's perfect, because it's all drag and drop. Yeah. And coding, I'll show you some of the codes. It's got its own scripting language. Anyway, so if I have a certification in a computer subject and program or, or piece of gear, um, that's going to help me get more money in my job, isn't it? A lot of organizations say you were working for an organization that was FileMaker certified. And they were sending out consultants to organizations like yours. You'd want them to have FileMaker certified people come to your shop and help you with, you know, providing solutions, correct? Yep. So for some organizations, it's required to have certified people on staff. Um, I know as part of our um, new, uh, what is it called? Accreditation that we're getting. It's not at actually- KCC. At KCC. It's not actually accreditation, but it's a, certification. They're looking for experience, and one of the ways we can show experience sure. is by showing that we have people who are certified and have continued their education beyond you know, their bachelor's sure. or, or... Well, and it goes to the point, if you're managing a company uh, and you have software and it's a, you, you paid money for it, you worked on it, you adapted it to you know, the company process, um, you want people to know how to use it. Yeah, really well, so that you get the most out of it. 
It's, it's an investment. The people are also an investment. I have to make sure everybody's on the same page. So if I were you know, in charge of such a thing, I would say everybody go out and get certified. Yeah, I, I would really agree with that. I think your organization would um, definitely benefit by having as much of the staff checked out on that software so that they are getting the most out of that software. Yeah. Because there's so many wrong ways to yeah. implement. Well, think, think, and I wanted to ask you about in terms of, uh, you know, our, our view of the world and of news events. In January, we had a false alarm in Hawaii with incoming missiles and the like by somebody who was sitting in front of a terminal, and maybe something went wrong there. Um, I, don't, I don't think he was certified in anything. He had experience at that terminal, but I'm not sure there was a certification involved. Um, and the question is, you know, did you have that reaction? I mean, was there a certification, do you think, that might have helped to avoid that? Well, depending on that particular software package, um, that sounded like a, something that was custom written, so there probably wasn't a um, certification. But I was thinking about that very incident, and it brought back an old adage from the computer world, to err is human, to really foul things up requires a computer. And <laughs> one press of the button, and he sent the world into a panic, right? Um, would a certification necessarily have helped? Maybe, maybe not. So certification isn't the end-all, be-all of um, computer knowledge. Yeah. So, but, but training is. In other words, training you, is. You, have, you have some companies that don't care about certification. I just want my people trained. I want to be sure in my own standard, my own way of looking at them and interacting with, with my human resources, that they know this stuff and they're using it right. They have the right sense about it. Um, so, I mean, what's the, what's the connection between regular corporate training, either in a school, you know, like you're doing, or in-house, like some companies do, they bring a trainer in, um, and certification. Um, do you need both? Uh, can you live on one? Oh, I like to relate these to things that people deal with every day. Food handler certification. Now, you can hire a person, and they can be a very good cook, but you still might want them to have that food handler certification. Whether they need it or not, it's something that you can put on your wall, and when a person walks into the restaurant, they can see that they passed, your restaurant's passed certain standards. Right. right. And, and, and they can assume that somebody decided what points it was important to teach the food handlers about. It's exactly. not at random. It was not casual. You, you know, there was a systematic identification of the issues and lessons involved, and that person has been exposed to all those issues and lessons. Yeah. So and the other thing is, and it, it comes out of the uh, whole thing. Well, it comes out of the January incident about the false alarm, but it also comes out of the food handling <clears throat> issue. I mean, these this knowledge, whether it's reflected in training or certification or both, is often mission critical. Um, and it's beyond that, it could be, you know, critical to the community, such as uh, the alarm. Um, people could get sick in the restaurant, not so good. Um, and so it goes beyond just, you know, a sort of technical knowledge. It's whatever the company, the organization is doing, if that has an effect on the community, then the, um, the training and certification of the individual uh, IT operator, for example, um, has an effect on the community too, and it could be a profound effect. Yeah. So this means hmm, this means that it's really important for the survival of the organization and the community. So I'm. I guess my question to you, Percy, is: Is the government involved in these things? Does the government around come around and say, you know, you must have certifications and this, that, and the other thing? Yes. So the Department of Defense has a DOD 8570 information assurance um, certification or um, initiative, and they use the CompTIA um, A+, plus, Network+, plus, and Security+, plus certifications to um, meet that initiative. And that's for all of their 
um, personnel who are in the information assurance field. So once again, very mission critical. Yeah. Um, what about stuff like the food handler? Is that is that is there, is there a statute or a regulation requiring food handlers to be certified? I would think so, and I'm not really familiar with uh, how restaurants. Well, are. Something the government should be looking at anyway. I believe that is a government regulation mm, that okay. says you have to. Everybody who's handling food has to. You know, in a in a world that is becoming more complex all the time, where the stakes are so high, what we, you know, what we do in, in the service industries and certainly in information technology, um, it's got to be, you know, more in the future than in the past. What I mean is, there's got to be some changes going on in this area, changes that you would teach about in your lectures, uh, changes that the certification agencies and organizations are going to adopt. But how do you see those changes coming down? You must see them happening. You've been around for a while. Uh, how, how are they happening now? How are they going to happen in the future? Well, the certifications need to change as quickly as the industry changes, but it's really hard for these organizations to write products that change in such a fluid environment. So as, say, Microsoft comes up with a patch for a product, so they can't rewrite their certifications just for that particular patch or vulnerability. So about every three years, they update their certifications and they update their products. And then they do hot fixes and between those times. Don't you think that's a long time, given the, the, the amount of change that happens in three years now? It would be really um, nice to be able to, say, require professionals to change every year. But I think that'd be really too demanding. Mm. Every three years is even very demanding. Mm. To, uh, for a person to stay up to date. So uh, CompTIA has something called uh, continuing education credits, similar to, say, your law degree. You don't take the bar every three years, even though things change. You continue your education, correct? Well, you have to go to continuing legal education, yeah. It's not that demanding in this state and other states, you know, from state to state it differs. But one thing that comes up in that, and, and I'm sure it comes up in uh, IT certifications, too, is how do you know that the person sitting in front of you taking the test is the person, you know, who's getting the certification? What you don't want, you must see this, be, this must happen, where somebody else comes in, sits in the chair, he's really good, he's a certification expert person, he comes in, he takes a, he does a great job, does, scores very well, and it's not the right guy. I think that would be really difficult. I've taken 30 to 50 certification exams. I kind of take them for fun now. And when you take the exams, you're asked for multiple forms of ID. Um, and they basically um, will take all of your possessions, so no cell phones. Uh, they've actually, if you're wearing glasses, they'll check for a camera embedded in your glasses. <laughs> they'll check for little cameras embedded in your, in your ties or your oh buttons goodness. on your shirts really? to make sure that you're not <coughs> taking exam questions home with you. It's, they realize that this is uh, big money stuff yeah. and how rigorous these exams are. So the odds of someone coming in and substituting themselves as you, I believe they're fingerprinting candidates. Is that right? Well, it's, it's appropriate. It's appropriate. And I, and I suggest to you it's one of the reasons why um, these certifications do not change that often and um, you know are relatively formalistic. I mean, you could have, uh, like in a newsletter, you could have a 10-question a a question, uh, questionnaire come to you um, every week reflecting your reading in the subject that week. And, uh, you know, 52 times a year, you get a little questionnaire, and somebody could, you know, uh, analyze the information, the answers that you give, and say, oh, he really knows his stuff, because he's always right. On the other hand, he could always be cheating, too. Sure. So, so in order to avoid cheating, you know, you have to have these formalities, I think. And so we have proctored exams. Yeah. And 
I've been through, like I say, 30 to 40 of these exams, and I can't see any way that someone could come in and substitute themselves for me. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is that I don't, I don't look like Dave Stevens, so you probably know it's not Dave Stevens. By this time, you probably know it's me, Jay. Percy, thank you. <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to fool you in an exam. No, no absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming down, Percy. Percy Ellis, a lecturer at KCC. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>